Do you see this? I I've shown these guys before in this, this filth. This, look at this. Look at this ecumenical lying Christian. Oh, God had a purpose for you before you were born. All right. See, now that is true. But see, the way they are using truth is to puff you up and eventually to get your money. But let me check this out. Check this out. Check this out. Check this out. Look at this. Jesus loves all children of the world and the unborn. <laughs> children of the world. Now, see, you and I of the Church of the Living God, we see children of the world and we're like, wait a minute. Now, the unborn, the children in the womb, the aborted children, uh, yes, yes, but children of the world? Who are the children of the world? And see, they're putting it off like, you know, you'll make you think about the uh, young hemetic children uh, who are starving to try to tug at your heartstrings. But that says children of the world. And what does the scripture say about the children of the world? You wicked devils. <clears throat> All right, that's it. Christian. Ah, that, that little video was shot yesterday. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I need not say anything more about that. But, please, get your authorized version of the scriptures. Follow me along in the scriptures that you and I will be looking at today. Follow me along word for word, verse by verse at the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Follow me along. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily whether these things be so. Check me out. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Okay? Please follow me along. Word for word, verse by verse. God had a purpose. God had a purpose for you before you were born. God has a plan for your life. Now see, this is the truth. But as I had mentioned in that video, I was quite upset. And I was quite upset with what I see. That that grieves me. And like I said in that video also, there had been, uh, there's another video floating around on the channel where I show that very thing with some of their wonderful little idioms that they put on there. But see, they're doing it to puff up your flesh. So you are made to feel like you're a special one. So you can pat yourself on the back. And that kind of mentality leads into dangerous areas, which will lead into, well, I'm not bad as so-and-so. God, I must have been, there must have been something good in me for the uh, Lord to die for me. See, it's there to puff up flesh. Okay. If that, if that was associated with the Church of the Living God, number one, it wouldn't be in one of them big buildings, number one, okay? You'd be meeting in people's houses, you know, from place to place, that kind of thing. Okay, one day we're going to meet in Brad's place. Another day we're going to meet in Joe's. Next day we're going to meet at Alexander's or whatever, okay? You, it would be something like that. It wouldn't be in a fixed, like a fixed place, okay? Okay, yeah, they might have done that before in the past, but before in the past is not what we have today, is it? Okay? But see, that is what Satan does within Christianity. He takes the glorious, glorious truth of Scripture and then twists it to bolster up this. Okay? But see, yes, God had a purpose for you before you were born. Yes, that is truth. What is that purpose? Turn with me to begin with Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 on to verse 33. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Of me. Hmm. Of me. Now see, like we've talked about before, in a Bible, it will say learn from me. And, okay, all right, the spirit of truth, which will lead you and guide you into all truth, and the Lord is that spirit, okay? Yes, the spirit of truth, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God our Father, okay? One God comprised of a spirit, soul, and body, just like you are, you and I are, okay? But see, yes, the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth, okay? He will teach you from the scriptures, the authorized version, okay? And it is within the scriptures that you learn of our Lord Jesus Christ, God, our Father, okay? All right? So we are to learn of him, okay? Not merely from him, but learn of him. And we learn of him by learning from him. Isn't that something? <laughs> Okay? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Okay? So we are to learn of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And while we are at this, go now to Romans chapter 8 okay Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 we want verses 29 and 30 okay Romans chapter 8 verses 29 and 30 for whom he did for no he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Who, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now the Calvinists will come to this and say that there's this thing uh, called predestination. That there are those who were chosen before the world began to be saved and there are those who were chosen before the world began to go to hell and there's not that's heresy that's heresy we are predestinated okay the predestinated there is there is only one way to be saved okay and that is by us being broken of our self-righteousness having godly sorrow, contrition, because it's our fault that he went to the cross, and having the fear of the Lord, because he is the one who's going to send you to hell. Okay? Brokenness, contrition, and the fear of the Lord. Okay? So, in predestination, what that is talking about is, God chose, for this dispensation, the way of the cross. Okay? And when you go the way of the cross, the way he chose, and he saves you, number one, you are predestinated to go to heaven. Once saved, always saved. Okay, but that is the way that the Lord chose the way of the cross from the very beginning. And you see references onto the cross, about the cross, in the Exodus, about how they put the blood on the top of the door and on the side posts, okay? The top of the cross and the sides of the cross, okay? While the cross itself is not mentioned, okay? That's a, you know, that's a type. It's like, okay, the door. Jesus Christ is the door. And in the uh, story of the Exodus, they put the blood on the top and on the side posts of the door. Jesus Christ is the door. And you go in by the door, you are safe, okay? So the Lord from the beginning chose the way of the cross but it was not really you got to be careful with this because a lot of people will like to tell you that they were looking forward to the cross all the way in the book of genesis uh no 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 because that contradicts with what paul said that it wasn't revealed until 
him until this dispensation. Okay? About that, go to Ephesians chapter 3. Not using uh, one of my normal sets of scripture. I'm using this hardcover. So, bear with me. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 6. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, you know, dispensations, in other ages, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto us, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the capitalist spirit himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? All right? The spirit, capital S, that means the Lord himself. Okay? So it wasn't revealed in other times as it is was revealed unto Paul for us today. Okay? They were not looking forward to the cross in the book of Genesis, they had no idea, okay? Well, Brad, you just said, yes, all things that were written for time were written for our learning. Yes, that was a type. It was, I mean, yes, like we said about the Genesis, but they were not looking forward to the cross because, the, or else we have a contradiction in the scriptures, don't we? Okay, be careful about when people say that, uh, you know, that they were looking forward to the cross all the way in the book of Genesis. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Uh, well, how do you explain Ephesians chapter 3 then, dear friend? Okay? <laughs> you got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? But, like I said, the Calvinists will come to this and say the, the, about the, that's a lie. Okay? God no, chose the way to salvation in this dispensation way back when he as he chose for the dispensation of the law okay god has his plans okay his big plan for all of mankind yes he does okay he chose the patriarchs abraham isaac and jacob to establish the hebraic people he gave the law he chose that he chose the way of the cross for this dispensation today okay that all might uh, be saved you know that all would uh, come to salvation. Not everybody is going to, okay? So the predestination here in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 on to verse 30 is not like Calvin and his disciples, such as John MacArthur, okay? Justin Peters, that swine, Paul Washer, okay? Those are just to name the big Vudi Bokham. My dear, sweet, hermetic sister, Vudi Bokham is not your brother. He is a Calvinist. He is not for your people. He is against your people, dear sister, okay? Vudi Bokham is not your brother, okay? He is a Calvinist. Beware of him, okay? That's all I've got to say about that, all right? But, so, okay, this isn't the predestination like the Calvinist says, okay? Then what, you know, being predestinated, what does it say here? What does it say here? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Well, what does that mean, Brad? What does that mean? Well, I'm good again. You want to know? Okay. Uh, here's a really good um, explanation for us in 2 Peter chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 2. Or is it 1 Peter? I, I have a habit of... Uh, uh, yeah, it's 1 uh, Peter. 1 uh, Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 on to verse 24. Being conformed to the image of his son. What does that mean? Okay? Hey, you ask a charismatic, 
well, that means, well, you don't sin anymore and that you have power to create things with your, your mouth. And, oh, well, by the way, uh, you're not really saved unless you've seen it or heard him. Says, go, go, go away. Go away. Go have another shrimp on the barbie, you psychopath. But um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 on to verse 24. For even hereunto were ye called, and what is the call? God chose the way of the cross. That is the way he called for man to come to the Lord to be saved, okay? For hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Well, Brad, we're supposed to, Paul is our example. Yes, Paul is our example today for the to the to us Gentiles, but also for Jewish people as well. But yes, we are to follow Christ as Paul followed Christ. He is our example. Okay? He is our example. Yes, he is. Okay? Yes, he is. This is not a contradiction. Okay? This is not a contradiction. Who did no sin, there we can't we can't do that. We cannot be sinless in this life. Again, I say to you, if anyone comes around telling you, you got to stop sinning or that they don't sin anymore, you laugh in their face and say to them, they are a liar and just walk away from you. <laughs> yeah, you don't sin. <laughs> you, just, you just lied there, pal. You just sinned. Okay, you just lied. Get get away from me. I thanks. I needed a good laugh. Now get get away from me. You you filth. Get away from me. Okay, <laughs> get away from me. All right. Don't don't even waste time with those people, brethren. Don't even waste time with them. Okay. You got some way. You got to stop sinning. You can't do that. Because okay, if you don't sin anymore. And you've stopped sinning, then you then these guys will twist that. It's like, well, see, we're being conformed to the image of a son, so you don't sin anymore. So then what? You're you're God then, right? I never whoa 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 whoa. There's spunky britches. Okay, <laughs> I've dealt with this before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait a minute. There's spunky britches. You just said, you know, in my face, you said you don't sin anymore. Mm -hmm. well, but you don't know the power of God. Uh, yes, I do. What God are you talking about? Okay. See, because when you say that you don't sin anymore, Christ, what is this? Say, who did no sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. Never once. No, not once. Okay, and you got to remember, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay, the flesh of Jesus Christ, the flesh that Jesus Christ is come into. This is what was tempted. This was the object of Satan's temptation, the flesh. Okay, because God cannot be tempted to sin. Okay, but yet Satan tempted Jesus. But then how do you reconcile that? Simple, okay? This is what was attempted to sin, not God that lived within. You understand? I know that's really hard for a lot of, a lot of idiots, and I'm being polite when I say that, to understand that. They, they can't understand that, okay? And since Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly... Okay, he's the only one who could. He never sinned. And he just happened to keep the law, the very law that he gave unto man. He kept it perfectly. Hence, okay, now this is, this is going to be really hard for a lot of these people, for some of these people. Okay, since Jesus Christ never sinned, he never had to do the offerings or anything, purification. So, while the flesh itself is sinful, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That flesh itself was sanctified by Jesus Christ keeping the law perfectly. Okay. 
This is not as uh, mind-boggling as some of these stupid idiots, and I'm being very polite when I say that, who want to say that it's blasphemy. Okay, no, no, you guys are lost. Okay, you have no understanding, no departing from evil. Okay, it's very, very simple. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. But anyway, all right, who did no sin, verse 22. We fail at that. We sin every day. Well, I don't sin every day. So there again, what? You're God, huh? You're just like she. <laughs> go, go. Don't, brethren, brethren, in my personal experience, um, when you are talking to someone who says that, who will say to you, I don't sin anymore, you got to stop sinning, um, you'll have better luck witnessing to a Catholic. Wow. And some of you who have witnessed to Catholics know how difficult that is. And you're like, wow, yeah, yeah. You got someone who is convinced they don't sin anymore and is going to, hey, I don't sin anymore. You, you must not be saved. Yeah, just shut up. That, that's, yeah. I have not had much success. We have not had much success with anyone like that. Not at all. Wouldn't even take, wouldn't even take a track. When it's like, no, I don't need that. Well, and, and usually when I run into that, or my wife, it's like, well, here, okay. <laughs> okay, you say you don't need it. Okay, take it and give it to someone who may. Okay, but with those guys, with that type, it's like, <laughs> okay, good luck. <laughs> good luck, all right? So we, we, we botched that, okay? Neither was guile found in his mouth. Now, that's something that you and I can work on having guile found in our mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Okay? Now there's where our some instruction for us, having no guile in our mouths. And when we are reviled, we revile not again. What does that mean? You don't fight fire with fire. Okay? All right? When he suffered, he threatened not. Okay? All right? But committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And as it says in the book of Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Okay? All right? Now, we cannot not sin. Okay? That's impossible for us. And if so, again, if someone comes around saying they don't sin anymore, brethren, get away, that that person is not saved, okay? That, that, no, get get away, get away from them. <laughs> Laugh in their face. Laugh in their face. Well, Brad, that's kind of, you know, stirring the pot. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. You got someone coming around saying they don't sin anymore. They're basically saying they are God, and you laugh at them. Laugh at them. Yes. <laughs> you don't sin. <laughs> Yeah, so you're God. I didn't say that. God can't sin. God never sinned. And you're not sinning anymore. You don't sin anymore. You, you're, you're, get away. <laughs> go. Just go. Put your head in the toilet and flush it. Okay? <laughs> get away. All right? Who his own self, because God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Okay? Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. Look that up, okay? Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now we cannot bear the sin of another person. Every one of us is going to give an account of himself to God. But we can bear one another's burdens, okay? We can do that. All right. Now, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Like I said, I'm not using like uh, my Cambridge or that other uh, uh, little handheld one. I'm using a hardcover today, and you needed to know that. But uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 on to verse 11. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. What things were gained to Paul that he is talking about here in context? Him being a Pharisee. 
doing the things that were under the law as uh, for salvation, which are not pertinent for us today for our salvation. You do not keep the law today to be saved. Stay saved or be right with God. We have covered that uh, immensely. Okay, so we're not going to get into it. If you have questions, scan the videos. It's there somewhere. Okay, but the things that were count that, but what things were gained to me? Okay, keeping the law. You can't keep the law even if you tried. You offend in one point, you mess it all up, okay? You can't, you, you don't keep the law today to be saved, okay? You don't keep the law today to be saved, okay? But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now stop right there. In verse 7, he's addressing about how he was in verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the Christians. <coughs> Excuse me. Persecuting the church. <laughs> touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Then it comes to verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. So all things, okay? Not just what he was making reference to of the things of the law, but, you know, being brought out from that, being brought out from that, and not being yoked up with that. And the Christian, well, we got to do that. He says, shh, don't get ahead of me. We'll, we're we're going to get to that. Don't, oh, don't you worry. Okay? First thing, second. Okay? So don't get ahead of me. Okay? But the Lord brought you out of Egypt, the world, okay, to be conformed to the image of his son. And we are to follow Paul, uh, his example, for us today in this dispensation on how to do that. And Peter gives us a couple good tips on how to do it too. Okay? All right? But Paul is our example, okay? He is. He was the apostle of the Gentiles. And remember, in Acts uh, chapter 15, they all got together at the Jerusalem conference. And after that, they were all on the same page preaching what Paul preached, okay? So it was the gospel that was revealed unto Paul, okay? As he said so in Ephesians chapter 3, okay? So we're not supposed to be yoked together with that, okay? Don't get ahead of me, all right? So, not to be yoked up with that. Count all things, all right? Uh, worldly friendships, being yoked up in worldly things, okay? Like I said, we're going to touch on that in a little bit more detail, so don't get ahead of me. Let's continue. In verse 8, let's read it again. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Not just about him, you know, being made aware, hey, I don't have to keep the law today to be saved, okay? And do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. That's why you got to watch out for these heretic lying devils who say you got to keep the commandments today. Okay, because they're establishing their own righteousness, which is not of the righteousness of Christ, who it is finished. Okay, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. For the kingdom of God is not in a word, but in power. Kingdom of God, spiritual. See, there are a lot of smooth talkers out there, boy. Oh, there are a lot of smooth, smoother than silk. And silk is pretty smooth. Smoother than silk talkers out there, okay? Who use big, technical sounding words as to try to convince you that's from the Holy Ghost. The Lord is that spirit. Okay? No, no. When you have to have, okay, when you have to have a dictionary with you just to follow along with somebody who's a preacher, 
Okay, there's nothing wrong. We love words. There's nothing wrong with using words, okay? Like, you know, but when you're using all these high-tech, you know, Jesuit-inspired words and stuff like that, that's a warning sign that they're using man's wisdom to try to convey to you spiritual things. And the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Yes, here, here's, here's your power. Here's your power. The authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? All right? You with me? Okay? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And what does Timothy say? Okay, and what does Timothy say about that? Not Timothy. What does Paul say unto Timothy? Excuse me. About that? Oh, well, Romans. Uh, Romans. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> Verses 11. On to verse 13. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. That's not talking about salvation. Okay, you're once saved, always saved if you come to him the way he called, the way of the cross. Once saved, always saved. Broken, contrition, and fear of the Lord. And he saves you. You're once saved, always saved. Eternally secure, okay? All right? This is talking about other things. If you deny him, he can deny you blessings. He can deny you peace, provision, fellowship, all other kinds of things. You don't have to worry about your salvation. Okay, this is not talking about salvation. If we believe not, yet... He abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Why? Because we are of his body, of his bones, and of his flesh. And with that, you go to Ephesians. What is that, brother? What is that? Uh, that's Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, uh, where, or is that 5? Where is that 5? Which one is that, brother? Which? Uh, ah, it's 5. Ephesians 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. He can't deny himself. Okay? We are not the Lord, God forbid. Why? Because we sin we sin every day. Okay? God can't sin. God never sinned. Okay? But we are part of him. He is part of us. Why? Because he dwells within us permanently. He cannot deny himself. You see how that works? Okay? So yes. God had a purpose before you for you before you were born. Yes. And that's to what? First Timothy, First Timothy chapter two, okay. But see the way these Christians, like in that video, uh, the way they uh, put it to you. Well, I must. I'm pretty. I ain't that bad, you know. I'm not that bad a person. Yeah, hey, there was something in me that God saw good enough to die for me, right? Good enough to die for. Yeah, yeah. Get over yourself and see. That's what they are putting on to you. That's why when you run into these Christians, they're some of the most arrogant, pompous asses that you will ever meet. Oh, Brett. Have you ever, have you ever worked with donkeys or asses before? I've told the story before about the one ass that was at the farm who had brains enough to, you know, in the chain link fence, you farmers, you know what I'm talking about, how they have in the, the, the big uh, gates of the chain fences where you could put the chain in there a certain way and turn the chain itself and then lock it. The one ass figured out how to, with his teeth, take the chain off and then would go out there and just stand there and look at you with that look on its face. It's like, ha, 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 look, I got out of the pen. What are you going to do? It's like... You know, that's, you know, if, if you've dealt with uh, those kinds of animals before, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then take offense and take a gate, okay? But uh, I mean, a lot of these Christians that you will meet, they're some of the most impudent asses that you will want to meet, okay? Pompous, you know, arrogant. Well, I, I don't need that. I, I need to... You think I'm lost and you think, and the, the Jeffrey Dahmer thing is always perfect. You think Jeffrey Dahmer's in heaven and you think I'm lost? Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> yes, I do. 
Yeah. Uh, first Timothy chapter two, verses one on verse six. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So, you know, praying for those in authority. Why do we pray that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, that we may be ambassadors for Christ? Okay? But when you have people in the government, such as President Harris and her frontman Smoking Joe, um, as controlled by the Jesuit order, they work for the Jesuits. Okay? They have made their choice. They are in league with Satan. Okay? We do not pray for them because why? Those guys have made their choice. They work for the Vatican. They are traitors and conspirators. Okay? They work for the Jesuit order. They are our enemies. Okay? What we pray for, for example, here in America, it's like, Lord, we don't know who you're going to save today. May you have mercy on this nation that you may save whom you will through your body, uh, the church of the living God. Okay? <laughs> All right? That's, that's what we pray for. Okay? You don't pray for someone who's working for the Jesuits, who serves Satan, who's, who will destroy you in a minute. No. No. Okay? All right? Verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men, Mr. Calvin, Calvinist, who will have all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That, that's, that's right there. Oh, and you should see the gymnastics that the Calvinist will, you know, it's like, wow, you deserve gold medal for that gymnastic display. You should see the gymnastics that these Calvinists will go to to try to explain away. Verse 4 there. Uh, uh, Calvin's book, um, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. Wow, man, you, you, you know it's going to bleed because of the headache that you will get with him trying to explain away that verse. When it's quite simple, this means who, would have, who will have all men to be saved. God does want everyone to be saved. Yes, he does. But not everybody is going to. Why? Because God has called you by a predestinated path that he chose a long time ago. It's called the cross. Okay? But see, Christianity and even these wonderful King James Bible and Christians, <laughs> um, they want to boot the door out of the way. And Jesus Christ is the door. And climb up some other way. Because... The way of the Lord to salvation for us today is simple. It is. The hard part is you got to get over you. And that is what so many people stumble at. And that's where Christianity comes in and says, well, God had a purpose for you before you were born. God loves you. God's not angry at you. See? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus, and his mother Mary. <laughs> and his mother Mary. Oh, wow, it doesn't say that, does it? Uh, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God did, God, yes, God had a purpose for you before you were born. To know him. To have fellowship, a relationship with him. He wants you to be in heaven with him. Yes, he does. But not everybody's going to go the way he has chosen. He's not everybody is going to go the way that he has predestinated the way of the cross. Okay? 
one too many people come to that door and kick it, boot it out of the way so they can climb up some other way and hold on to their self-righteousness and their little pet sins that they love so much. That is an unfortunate thing. But that is the reality of the situation. And Christianity is the culprit of this. One of the culprits. And, and what, what was that other thing of that video? Jesus loves all the children of the world and the unborn. God loves everybody. Huh? What about that? Hmm? What about that? Well, what, what, what's the, when you meet one of these people, God loves you, what, what do they first say? What do they, uh, well, well, don't judge. Well, yeah, that's probably the most uh, well-known verse in Scripture. <laughs> and it's judge not that ye be not judged, not judge not lest ye be judged, okay? Judge not that ye be not judged, okay? <laughs> okay? But, uh, you know, <laughs> and on that, okay? The most popular and most well-known verse among lost people, and especially amongst the Christians, uh, judge not that ye be not judged. <laughs> Matthew 7, verse 1. It's not judge not uh, that ye be, uh, judge not lest ye be judged. It doesn't say that. Judge not that ye be not judged. Okay? But, where do they go to? Where do they go to? You know this. Where do they go to? To justify Jesus loves all present tense. All the children of the world. And like I said in that video. And what the Christian wants you to put in your mind. Is the little hamedic child. Who's starving. Whose belly is bloated. Because of the starvation. Okay. I've heard people was like. Boy that kid's got a bigger belly than I do and he's starving that that's one of the you know of starvation okay all right all right especially with children okay so never mind that but yeah they want you to picture all the little children and the thing about this is where and it says where they said sign says and the unborn this has to do with the age of accountability once again Okay? We're all born sinners. Okay, But the Lord is not going to hold one accountable until they are aware of the magnitude of what it means that they are a sinner. Okay? And that there is no specific age. Okay? There really isn't. It's a safe bet to tell you that by the time that someone reaches their 20s, by then... Okay, you're past the age of accountability. You are, you know enough to know. You don't know who the Lord, you know who the Lord is, but you don't know him through relationship. Okay, by the time someone reaches their 20s, it is a safe bet that they know that, okay, that is not always the case. Okay, like I said to you before, it's dependent on the Lord and the person, spirit, soul, and body. Okay, all right. But, you know, an 11-year-old depends on many things. But generally, usually, an 11-year-old is not going to have the concept of what it means that they are a sinner. Okay? Oh, they, they know that they've done wrong things. But the magnitude of what it means that you have sinned against the Lord. Okay, and it doesn't, and it doesn't take you being a rocket scientist to figure that out. It's no, it's quite simple. But children, especially children, okay, aren't going to know that. And the unborn, yes, the aborted child, okay, the aborted child, and people, well, God knows, you know. You know, they go to Jeremiah, before you were in the womb, I knew thee. And even a child is known by his own doings, whether they be good or whether they be right. Okay? All right? Some will argue that. Um, God is not a God who plucks the wings off of flies. Okay? God is a fair and just God. Yes, we're all born sinners. 
Yes, we are. But the child that is born into this world is sinner, but yet has no concept nor anything of what it means that they have sinned against the Lord and can't grasp the concept of Jesus Christ as our propitiation, okay? They are innocent. Yes, absolutely. You know who you are, brother and woman. Um, the child that you had aborted when you were lost, that child's in heaven, okay? You had an oopsie as you believed, and you and that woman you talked into having an abortion, let's not sugarcoat it. You murdered your child. You did. Doesn't matter if you were ready or not. God doesn't make mistakes. Okay? You decided to fornicate, and you made that woman with child. And rather than being a man and being a woman, you committed murder. But see, that child is in, is in heaven. Absolutely. Absolutely. When it comes to that, brethren, we can't sugarcoat it. We can't. Abortion is murder. Abortion is murder. All right? And there are those of you of my brethren who can uh, give many a testimony of my best friend. Uh, you know, he, he can give the testimony of his mother who, um, you know, if he chooses to, he could put that in the description box for you or in the comment section for you, okay? But abortion is murder, okay? So yes, in that respect, a child before the age of accountability Whatever that age is, there is no set age. Like I said, it is safe to say that when somebody reaches their 20s, they're going to be aware of it. They're going to have the, the concept of, okay, yeah, I've sinned against God. And you know what? I don't care. Okay. And I was 20 once myself. <laughs> okay. Over 20 years ago. But yeah, that's why it's not a good idea for 20 somethings to get involved in such things like uh, ministry or whatnot. I mean, there are exceptions. Timothy was the exception because he was brought up in the scriptures when he was a child, okay? When he was a child, he had the scriptures and he was brought up in that, okay? He was more better suited because of that, okay? But never mind. But what are they truly getting at when they say to you, these Christians, Jesus loves all the children of the world and the unborn. Now, what we just talked about the, uh, about the age of accountability thing, yes, that's there. But what are they truly saying? What are they, and where do they go to to prove this? For God so loved, loved the world. That's past tense. Loved. Here's a challenge for any of you Christians. In the authorized version of the scriptures, I'm not saying a Bible, the authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? I don't know about the Bibles. You never know with the Bibles. But with the perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures, here's a, here's a challenge for you. Within the text of scripture, Find me, God loves you. Find it for me. In the authorized version of the scriptures. Put the verse in the, in the comment section. Go ahead. Go ahead. Find it for me. Find God loves you in the scriptures. I don't know, and nowadays they probably got that in the New Revised Standard Version or something like that. That's not the Scriptures. That's a Bible. There's a big difference, okay? Find God loves you in the Scriptures for me. Put it in the comment section. Go ahead, please. For God so loved, past tense, the world, that he gave, past tense, 
his only begotten son. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh. Okay? Differing from the Old Testament, when God would appear in the form of a man, but see, that was the thing. He could come and go, come and go, come and go. Here, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. He was born of a woman, okay? God manifest in the flesh. That's what that's talking about, okay? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, see, you also got to be, you got to rightly divide the word of truth here, because this is being said before the death, burial, and resurrection. Because why? The devils also believe. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Okay? And also you got to remember, before the death, burial, and resurrection, Church of the Living God, you know this. What was the Lord Jesus Christ offering unto the Jewish people? The actual, physical, literal kingdom of heaven. Okay? Beg your pardon. And the kingdom of heaven is all works. No faith is involved in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because you're going to be able to see the Lord on the throne. Okay? You have to keep that in mind. But they come to John 3.16. John 3.16. And they say, you see, God loves you. Um, love the fun. Um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How in the wide world of sports entertainment do you get God loves you out of that? Hmm? How? Well, to justify sin, people will come up with anything, right? See, again, God chose the way of the cross. And he has called you, whoever you are, to come to him the way of the cross, which is death to your self-righteousness. Being a man, being a woman, taking uh, responsibility and being accountable that it was you who put him on the cross and having the hell scared out of you, fearing the Lord. Okay? And when you, this, it, and you know, it, it isn't a step one, step two, step three, are you saved, brother? No, it's not like that. It happens in one fell swoop. When you are broken and brought to that point, you know, it's like, I did this to you, Lord. And you're going to send me to hell. I deserve to go to hell. Please, Lord, save me. Okay? And see, lost converts don't understand that. Why? Because they're not saved. They've never experienced it. They might have been to the edge of that brokenness, but they haven't been truly broken. But let's do something that a lot, of, a lot of them do not do. John 3.16 is not the gospel, dear friend. you got to remember, you got to rightly divide the word of truth. This is before the death, burial, and resurrection. And before the death, burial, and resurrection, the law was still binding because the perfect sacrifice for sins had yet to be made. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. By the death, burial, and resurrection, and the blood that he shed on the cross to make atonement for sins. Okay? That had yet to happen. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? But, let's continue. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay? Okay? in context of offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jewish people. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Oh, what's his name? <laughs> and this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. They don't read those other verses to you, but they just 316 until you're blue in the face. Okay? Hmm. 
So, number one, you got to be rightly dividing the word of truth. This was said before the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? And number two, it's past tense. Because he had not died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scripture. And he was offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jewish people, the actual physical, literal kingdom of heaven where he would be king sitting on a throne. And when he, when you can see the man, you don't need faith. Okay? All right? In your personal witnessing unto lost people, there can be a place where John 3.16 can be used. But it is not the gospel. It is not the gospel that we preach today. No, it isn't. Okay? All right? Uh, Luke chapter 16. Just one verse. Luke chapter 16. Now, see, they say Jesus loves all the children of the world. And you can, Ezekiel chapter what? 18 me till I'm blue in the face. Okay, go ahead. But what's the condition? That they what? Repent. And what's the repenting that you are doing? Repenting of your sins. You couldn't do that at gunpoint. The repenting that you are doing is of your self-righteousness. You know, patting yourself. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Okay? That's the repenting that is necessary to come unto the Lord to be saved. That is the repentance. Okay? I've called around before. The, you know, the, the Catholic church buildings. They're all Catholic church buildings. In my, uh, in my town here. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Oh, really? Just believe, huh? Well, what, what about repentance? Well, repentance is going from unbelief to belief. Uh, so it's just believe. Yeah, just believe. Uh, and repentance is going from unbelief, from going from unbelief to belief. Uh, no, no. The repentance that is talked about in Scripture for us today is the repentance of you are repenting of your self righteousness. Okay. Okay. See, that is what I just said to you about you know going from unbelief to belief. That's repentance. No, that's the heresy of easy believism. Okay. But Luke chapter six. Try that one time in your locality. Go ahead and call your church buildings. And ask them, what must I do to be saved? I can almost guarantee you that they will uh, believe on the Lord and you shall be saved. And when you ask them about uh, repentance, well, they say, they'll say stuff, well, you can't repent of your sins. And it's like, I know that. But what is repentance? It's like, well, going from unbelief to belief. Okay, goodbye. Hang up on. Hang up on. Okay. But Luke chapter 16, just one verse. Verse 8. About the uh, children of the world. See, like I said, what they want you to believe, uh, when they say that, that God loves all the children of the world. And we already talked about the thing about the age of accountability. But what is the hidden thing that they are saying there? God loves everybody. Everybody. Even those who have heard the gospel and reject him. God loves him. That's what they're saying to you with that. Very, very subtle, like Christianity is. Luke chapter 16, verse 8, about the children of this world. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Mm. Wiser in what? The fear of the Lord? No. The wisdom that is first what? Earthly, sensual, and devilish. Okay? We have, uh, there's a video where we go through the unjust steward. I can't remember which one it is. But we, we've talked about the unjust steward before. But uh, and a little bit more on this children of this world. Go to, of course, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, verses 1 on verse 3. And you, talking to saved people, hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Hmm. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. Because Satan is a fan of flesh. He savoreth not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man, flesh. And remember, uh, Satan was cursed in the Garden of Eden to crawl on his belly and to eat dust all the days of his life. And what is man made out of? Dust. Yeah. But, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. So, okay, let's, let's unpack this a little bit. So, we, and you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Talking about saved people. You and I, who are saved of the church of the living God, we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. Lost sinners. You and I, we are saved sinners. Okay, they're lost sinners. Okay? Okay? You with me? So, a lost sinner walks, does what? Walks according to the course of this world. And they are also, they are referred to as children of disobedience. People like to say, well, a child of disobedience is someone who's saved and gets messed up. No. You hear the true gospel and you reject it. You're a child of disobedience. You hear the true gospel presented to you, okay, that you're not good. That there's none good. No, not one. That includes you. It's your fault that Christ died. And unless he saved you, unless you get right with him, he's going to send you to hell and you're going to burn forever and you deserve to go there. It doesn't have to be that way. But you're not a good person. You can't save yourself. It's your fault he went to the cross. And unless he save you, unless you get right with him, he's going to send you to hell. And you're going to have to give an account to him one, one day. It doesn't matter what you believe on that aspect alone. One day, whoever you are, wherever you are, you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account. Okay? You better get right with him. All right? You hear that gospel, how that Christ Jesus died, buried, and rose again, third day according to the scriptures, that he shed his blood on the cross to make an atonement for your sin. Okay? You hear that gospel and you reject it. You're a child of disobedience. And the children are of disobedience are what? Children of this world. Which we were also at one time. So when they say Jesus loves all the children of the world and the unborn, we already talked about the age of accountability. What are they saying to you? God loves you. God loves everybody unconditionally. Mm. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6. What is it? Oh, uh, well, one second, please. I beg your pardon about that. Uh, Colossians. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. <clears throat> Colossians 3. Verses 1 on to verse 7. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Hmm. Children of disobedience, which are the children of wrath. Okay? In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Okay? So, okay, now hold up. Hold up. Hold up. A child of disobedience, which is a child of wrath, okay, is what? A child of this world. So see, when you see on a billboard sign like that one at the beginning of this video, Jesus loves all the children of the world. Wait a second. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Children that are uh, before the age of accountability? Yes, but see, that's not what they're talking about because the other side of that disgusting sign, God had a purpose for you before you were born. It's the God loves you unconditionally thing. When a child of the world is what? A child of wrath, a child of disobedience. That's what a child of the world is. And you got church buildings saying that God loves all people. Mm. Unconditionally. But see, when you hear the gospel and you reject it, you are a child of disobedience. You are a child of wrath. Okay? God's wrath is upon you when you reject the gospel. Okay? you got to understand that. All right? So when they say children of the world, they are saying to you, God loves everybody, even those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Go to John chapter 15. Okay? John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We want verses 18 and 19, just two verses. Our Lord says, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world will love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And remember, the Lord called us out of Egypt, the world, that we may be as ambassadors. So we're not to be yoked up with that again. Okay? But God loves, loved the world, past tense, okay? I have yet to see even in a Bible where it says God so loves the world. That would be a little too obvious. But it's God loved, past tense, and gave. God's love is there for you at the cross. And it's to the cross you have to go. And the cross is death. Death to yourself. See, Christianity comes in with all this. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for your life. To bolster up what? Your flesh. Those people were of the church of the living God. There's none righteous, no, not one. It's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault. The Lord doesn't save you, you are going to hell. But no, that would scare people away. And the Christian is a friend of the world. And the, the Lord's like, no, no, of course. The, let's go, let's, let's do the obvious. Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who are you proving that to? Yourself? Or to those to whom you have been called to be an ambassador or two? Hmm? And some will be like, well, well, you know, we're, so, we're supposed to be amongst lost people, right? We'll get to that in a second. But before we get to that, before we get to that, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 on verse 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Yoke. We read how our Lord said, 
Beg your pardon? Take my yoke upon you. The yoke. Two oxen would fit in a yoke. Okay, not the yoke of an egg, Mr. Smart, uh, Smart Alex, okay? But uh, two oxen would fit in a yoke. That's the yoke. And they would plow the field together, okay? Um, what would happen if you put uh, an oxen with a donkey? It would be lopsided, okay? So the yoke implies what? Two trying to plow together of a field, okay? That's, that's the simplest uh um, example I can give you. So, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This also encompasses marriage. Okay? Marriage. It does. It does. It, en it encompasses because what is, a, what is a more greater example of being yoked with someone rather than in marriage? Right? And what happens when you're unequally yoked in marriage? What happens? Oh, well, all kinds of things happen, don't they? You can't agree on even the simplest things. And what makes it worse is when a hint of religiosity gets into the picture. We're not to be yoked together with unbelievers, okay? This also en uh, encompasses marriage. But it, uh, it also encompasses our daily lives, okay? Hold up. We're going to get to about what the Christian likes to say, what we're supposed to be in the world. We're going to get to that in just a moment, okay? But be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, what height a fellowship is there except in marriage. Okay? But also, friendships. You're, you're good buddies. Okay? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Why? Because your life will be a living disaster. What fellowship hath light with darkness? What fellowship do you, Church of the Living God, have with someone who wants to be neck deep in the world? What fellowship... What fellowship can you have with someone who is worldly? Who loves the things of the world? You can't. You can't. And in marriage, oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Now... The Christian will say, well, wait a minute. We're supposed to be in the world. Okay? We're supposed to be in the world. We're supposed to witness on the world, onto the world. Yes, we are. And for that, we go to where? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 20. Okay? And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? We've already looked about how we once were in that. God has called us out. God doesn't want us to be yoked together with that again. Okay? Hold on. To wit, 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And that's any of us of the church of the living God. We are all in the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? Now, sisters, ye know that you are not supposed to be teachers, okay, or preachers of in this capacity. You know that. But there are a myriad of ways that a sister can be used as an ambassador for Christ, especially among other women, okay? Especially, all right? All right? But we are all in some construct of a way, okay? We are all in the ministry of reconciliation. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And but see, the Christian will say, well, we're, we're supposed to go. Uh, we're, you know, we're supposed to intermingle with the, the lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Amen. Amen. But what does Christianity tell you? Hmm? Here's what the scriptures tell you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20, uh, excuse me, verses 9 on to verse 13. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or, or extortioners, or with idolaters. Then must ye needs go out of the world. Okay? Yes. Okay? We are in the world. We're not of the world. Yes, our daily lives, our daily existence. Okay, you go to work. You're going to encounter lost people, okay? And we are ambassadors for Christ. Yes, yes. And nowadays, as we are experiencing, a majority of the witnessing that we are doing seems to be accountability uh, tracting and accountability witnessing. Because, um, you know, where even last year, uh, many doors were being opened. But now those doors that are opening are becoming fewer and fewer where more as we are being used as accountability, witnessing, you know, holding people accountable, okay? But nonetheless, we are to be examples unto the lost. And if they don't want to hear the, because faith cometh by hearing it and hearing by the word of God, if they don't want to hear the witness or testimony from us, Another way we can witness and test, give testimony unto them is how we align our life according to the scripture. The testimony and witness that we can give without our mouth. Okay? Usually that encompasses accountability tracting. You know, when you got some guy who can pummel you into an oblivion, smacking the tracks out of your hand, and you back off, it's like, hey, and people see that, it's like, hey, Pick them up, it's like, hey, man, fine, fine. Or they kick gravel at you or throw pop at you, okay? And people see that, okay? And you're like, hey, man, <laughs> you, you, okay, you've heard the truth. Uh, you're a child of wrath. You're a child of disobedience. Good luck. See you later. I'm going, going over here now, okay? The closer we get to the redemption of the purchased possession, I personally believe that's what's going to happen more so that whereas even of last year where the Lord was opening doors, hey, speak to that person or you guys, me and my wife, you know, speak to them, you know, about, you know, you get the scriptures out and speak to them. Amen. But as time is progressing, it seems that more and more so it's more of accountability because people slowly but surely just don't, I mean, they, people don't want to hear the truth. But, I mean, the doors are closing. They're not closed all the way because if the doors were closed all the way, I believe the body of Christ wouldn't be on the earth. That's what I believe, okay? Like I've said to you before, the, titan the, the front part of the titan Titanic is under the water, broken off and fallen down to the ground, uh, to the seabed. The rear end of the Titanic is pointing straight up and bobbling, filled with air still. 
sooner or later, all that air is going to rush out and she's going to sink. Okay? All right? But now let's read verse 11. But now I have written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother is called a brother. You are if you say you are, huh? Yeah, you call yourself a brother, huh? Yeah, yeah, okay. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to... We got to read verse 12 and 13, on to verse 13. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without... Do not ye judge them that are within. There's that thing about judging again, which Christians really have a hard time with. But them that are without God judgeth. How does he judge them? According to the word, the scriptures. Okay? But them that are without, are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay? So Paul addresses, okay, yeah, if someone who is called a brother be one of these children of the world and they call themselves a brother, put that person away from you. Okay, get away from them. Because we are called to be ambassadors for our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, on that, let's go now to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 on to verse 10. Okay? Now, Hold on. Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 on to verse 10. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Did I miss that part? No. Okay. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit, capital S, the Lord himself, shall of the Spirit, capital S, reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all. All men, especially, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Ah, here we go. Here we go now. There are some out there, um, and I have noticed this in a, a select choice few of the King James Bible believing Christians who say that we shouldn't even help the lost people at all. And they, and they come up with many valid arguments for that. But see, you see here, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And what is good? There is none good but who? God. So, it says all men, and in that verse it makes a distinction, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. There are those out there who will tell you that um, you shouldn't help the lost at all. And what am I to say about that man who helped me? When I was lost, that man who I am to this day was, I'm convinced that man was an angel. Who gave me, yeah, he gave me that little Gideon's, green Gideon's that I carried around for a while. But um, yeah, that, that man who actually was quite the thing, was like imperative to me to, for coming to the Lord. That, you know, him. Um, I, I'm convinced that man was an angel. I'll, I'll meet him up there, I'm sure. Never knew his name. I only met him once. Long-haired, lost man having an affair with a married woman. 
and he witnessed to me. And I was lost. Or we who are saved and there's a lost person who needs help in some way. And you got some of these and a, uh, select King James Bible believing Christians who say don't help them. And again, I, I submit unto some of you, where would you be if uh, someone of the Church of the Living God didn't help you? See, this is a slippery slope. This is a very slippery slope. Very slippery slope that too many people, see, too many people get the wrong idea about this. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Okay, Romans chapter 12. Now, we're not addressing when our Lord says about, you know, if the publicans love their, uh, you know, if you love those who do good to you, don't even the publicans the same. We're not going to go there because when our Lord said that in context, that was for the kingdom of heaven. We're dealing with stuff that is pertinent for us today doctrinally in this dispensation through the Pauline epistles. Okay, we're not going to what our Lord said, because that is specifically in context for the kingdom of heaven. Okay? But we're going to deal with what the Lord would have us to deal with today. Romans chapter 12. This is, where was that? 17, or was that? Oh, 17 under verse 21. Okay? Now remember how we looked in um, 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay? When our Lord uh, was threatened, he uh, reviled, he didn't threaten. And he didn't fight fire with fire. Okay? And see, pacifists will come to that and say, okay, if someone's going to shoot you, just let them shoot you. Uh, no. No. Or some crazy's going to stab you, let them stab you. Don't fight. Don't defend yourself. I got a wife. Okay? Someone's going to try to kill me, and I can't bolt or run. I'm going to defend myself. Okay? I'm going to defend myself. And I'm going to do my best to knock that guy's head in. Okay? Brad, that's not very Christian of you. I'm not a Christian. Okay? All right? But yes, the, the, beware of these pacifists, you know, with their weird escalation of force kind of thing. If someone's going to try to kill you, defend yourself. Okay? Depraved indifference is sin. Okay? All right? But, Romans chapter 12, verses 17, on to the close of the chapter. Recompense, with an S, it's a verb. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Because remember, we're ambassadors for Christ. If it be possible as much as life in you live peaceably with all men dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord and of course Paul is quoting what is that uh, Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 Okay, that's what he's quoting. Okay? Verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And of course, uh, verse 20, he is talking about Proverbs. What is that? 25 verses 21 under verse 22. Check that out on your own. Okay? All right? Be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. Hmm. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? If thine enemy hunger, feed him. Give you an example. If my good friend from England were dangling from a cliff, he's going to hell. And if he were to fall from that cliff, he would go straight to hell because he'd die and whatnot. Would you help him up? Yes, I would. Yes, I would. 
Would he do the same for you? No! He would take out his beloved baseball bat and bash my fingers so I would fall. And if that didn't work, he'd get in his car and run my fingers over with his car. Okay? No, they wouldn't do the same for us. But you would still help out this guy. You would help him up from a cliff, even though he would not do the same thing for you. Hmm. Or if, he, if they were destitute, needed food, because having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You wouldn't? You mean, you would give him, like, a, buy him a burger? You would go sit and have uh, food with him? I probably wouldn't sit and have food with him. Uh, uh, so I'm just going off of the, uh, uh, my dear friend from England, but um, I would go with him and get him some food. You know, it's like, here, here's, here, man, eat something, eat, you know, while he'd eat and he'd probably spit it all at me. But that, you know, that's, you know, in so doing, what is that? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Okay? A good example of this is the homeless. I have heard. Some of these King James Bible-believing Christians who say, don't help the homeless. Or they talk about a true stereotype about how a majority, and this is true, not in every incident, but it is true. Majority of the time when you go and give $20 on... I gave... I one time... Gave a homeless individual money for a hotel room. I made the mistake of not going there and buying it for him and watching him go into the hotel. Okay. After that, then, you know, poor, uh, in so doing, uh, shall heap coals of fire on his head. But I gave him $70 to go get a hotel room here in Woodstock at Bob's Motel. And th that's the name of the place. It's Bob's Motel. Okay. It's a dump. It's prostitution, drug addicts, but it's the cheapest motel in all of Woodstick, okay? It's, it's actually called Bob's Motel, okay? No puns intended there. But I gave him the $70 to do that. I, I on my health phone and online, I keep tabs on the McHenry County Sheriff's, where it lists the people who get arrested. The very same day, later in the evening, that same individual that I gave the $70 to, his face was in the police thing. And what was he arrested for? Possession of a controlled substance. So yeah, the $70 that I gave that homeless man to get a hotel room or motel room, he used it obviously to get drugs. Okay? Okay? Yeah, that, that's what you get, Brad. Yes. But see, that's not the case for every incident. Okay? That's why when it comes on to the homeless, and this is a great example. No. I'm, you know, don't give them 20. Uh, and I, like I said, this is not the case for every single homeless person. But you, as a church of the living God, okay? Come on, man, let's... Let's go get a bite to eat. You know, let's, let's go get something to eat. Okay? And then, you, you know, you'll see. You'll see. Uh, because if they stall, and then you if they stall a little, it's like, no, man, I don't want to bother you. I just want a little money. I mean, are you hungry? You just said you were hungry. Let's go. You know, I, let's go. Let's have a bite to eat. You'll get out in out of this cold. It's like, nah, that's okay, man. I, I just, and then you're like, you just want the money, don't you? Yeah. Sorry, man. You're hungry? Let's go. You're thirsty? Let's go. I'll get you something to drink. Okay? Let's go. Okay? You need a coat? There's there's this one guy walking who was walking around, and praise the Lord, someone got to him before I did, who was walking around with, like, these, these shovel pants, and it was cold, and had it, like, down to his legs and whatnot, and I was going to the one day, you know, come and find them. It's like, hey, let's go to the resale shop. Let's get you a pair of pants, man, if you, you know, let's get you a pair of pants, okay? Stuff like that, okay? But like I've encountered, you know, it's like, hey, let's go. Let's go get something. It's like, no, it's like, you just want my money, don't you? 
Yeah. What do you want it for? Oh, expletive. It's like, okay. But then there are those when you say, hey, let's go get something to eat. My wife and I, the one time in Chicago, you know, waiting for the train. We were in Chicago. We had a, just a great day in Chicago. Great day of tracking and witnessing. Oh, oh, anytime we can get to the big city, I haven't been there for a couple of years now, but every time we can get to the big city to do some witnessing and tracking, whoa, beautiful, beautiful. But anyway, we were waiting for the train and there was the homeless guy out there. And my wife and I was like, hey, you want something to eat? And the guy was very timid and he's like, yeah, I haven't eaten and stuff like that. It's like, okay. So we went in and, of course, it, it, uh, if you've ever been to Chicago, to Ogilvy train station, they have the food center there and whatnot. I don't know since the, uh, the scamdemic or whatnot, but this was before that. And we got the guy some food and we got ourselves food. And the guy, the guy wouldn't sit with us, but he sat over there. That guy devoured that food and we got McDonald's, unfortunately. Okay, but hey, hey. That guy, we, we sat here, he sat over there. That guy devoured that stuff like there was no tomorrow. And, you know, I bought a couple of things and it's like, hey, man, you know, and I said, you know, hey, can you want another one? It's just like, whoa, took it out of my, that guy gobbled that stuff up like there was nothing, like nothing, man, nothing. He was actually hungry. And we he's like, come sit with us. He's like, he didn't want to sit with us and whatnot. He, and he was kind of misty-eyed about it because, you know, someone actually took the time and helped him out, okay? And, of course, he, he wanted to leave, and he was, you know, you know, thank you, thank you. It's like, hey, hey. And we had tracks. It's like, here, can you take these? And he took them, and that was that, okay? All right. Or with uh, other incidences, you know, uh, talking with some homeless people, the same thing. Going to the store, bringing them back food. When they were uh, uh, camped out there, you went and it's like, hey, hold on, I'll, I'll go get us something to eat and I'll be back. And, and go back to them and uh, eat with them and talk with them. And, and you present the Lord to them as an ambassador for Christ. And then they get all crying and weep on you and get snot on your shirt and all that stuff. Okay? You would be amazed. And how many people out there just want to be heard? Hmm? Also, there's a time where the one guy who uh, I met at the uh, at one church building thing um, for like homeless people, okay, who had a place, but his electricity was about to get shut off. It was $54. I'll never forget it. And I saw him at the one um, convenience store and he was there. I'm like, hey, man. And he was all dejected and he was crying. And he's like, you know, and he had his electric bill on him. He's like, my electricity is going to be shut off. And it's like, I, I need my electricity. Because he lived in an apartment like, like this. And, he, and you live in an apartment like this, everything you have is electric. Okay. And he was struggling. And he was a, he was a veteran of, uh, what was it, Desert Storm? A soldier in the army. Like a lot of the soldiers who fought for this Jesuit nation who are now homeless. Yeah, there's a, yeah, let me go ahead and piss on your foot while I'm at it. Yeah, that's the thanks that some of our veterans who fought for this Jesuit nation and are now homeless, by the way. Yeah, that's thanks for you. But this guy, he was a veteran of um, a Desert Shield, or whatever that was. And, you know, he had pictures on his wall and whatnot. And he's like, um, my electricity is going to get cut off. And he, he did get a little help from the government. Yes, he did. But he, for whatever reasons, and what for whatever reasons, that wasn't my concern. But I looked at him and was like, okay, man, let's, let's go pay your electric bill. And you should have seen his look. And it's like, you know, got the equivalent, kind of like, hey, he was riding a bicycle. I had a car at that time. I worked in the secular world at that time. And it's like, hey, leave your bike here. It's like, well, someone will see it. Well, I can't fit it in my car, man. You want your bill paid or not? It's like, okay. <laughs> All right. So we go to the currency exchange, and we go in there, and it's like, you know, I, I paid his bill for him. That man, you should have seen him, wept, cried. And was almost choking me. Okay? He was lost. And is lost. 
and cried together and went back and I, uh, he was lost and got the chance to witness to him. Um, this man also, come to find out, was an abuser to women. Yeah, he, he had a lot of problems and he's on his way to hell. But he cried on me. We embraced. It's like, hey, man, you know, paid his electric bill. Oh, and by the way, he was a Hamite. He was a Hamite. You let a Hamite cry on your shoulder and also put snot on you. And you, yeah, yeah. And you know what? There are some of these Christians out there who say, well, Hamites don't want me of Japheth to witness to them. You go shut up. I have encountered that before with some of these King James Bible believing Christians. That, well, I, I you know, I, uh, Hamite doesn't want me of Japheth to witness to him. Uh, okay, what about the Lord? I have actually encountered that. It's like, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm white. I'm only going to witness to white people. Are you crazy? Are you not? You're crazy. Yeah, and some of these Christians, man, they, they'd be like that. Well, uh, he's not my same skin color, so I'm not going to witness unto him. You know what I say to a Christian like that? Go to hell. Go to hell. When you were lost, did someone of the Church of the Living God ever help you out? Should we? I mean, yes, and like we said, um, especially for the, uh, especially of the household of faith, okay, to do good unto all men, especially unto the household of faith, okay, especially. So yes, our brethren, in any way we can help them, prayer, food paying their bills, giving them a little cash, giving them clothing, whatever, however we are able. Yes, but should we shun and spin on those who are not of us? Hmm? Should we only be merciful and show kindness unto those who are our, of our own? Hmm. Now, now, let's go to a part in Matthew chapter 7. Okay, Matthew chapter 7. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Just one verse. Matthew chapter 7. And we've got to remember, like I said before, Matthew chapter 7 is for the kingdom of heaven. Okay, but Matthew chapter 7, just one verse. Verse 6. See, some of these Christians, uh, especially it seems of the King James Bible believing Christians, will say, uh, Give not that which is holy on to the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under, your, under their feet and turn again and rend you. See, this is why you don't help lost people. And, and this is a valid argument. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay? Yes, it is. Why is that? Why is that? Uh, go now to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 2. That, 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 is, that, that cannot be a disputed thing, brethren. That, is, that cannot be disputed. There comes a point where you are exactly what? Uh, where you are casting your pearls before swine or giving that which is holy unto the dogs. Note the dogs and the swine there. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 on to verse 22. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who lived in error. Who are the ones speaking great swelling words of Vanity, God had a purpose for you before you were born. That's true. We already covered that. But see, the way they are implying it is that, you know, God loves you. You're not as bad as these other people. Or 
Jesus loves all the children of the world and the unborn. Before the age of accountability, sure. Okay, yes, they would go to heaven if they died, yes. But all the children of the world? Who are the children of the world? The children of this world are children of wrath, children of disobedience. Children who are walking according to the course of this world. Okay? Whose minds are blinded by the prince of this world, who is the little g-god of this world, Satan. Okay? You see? So who are the ones who are speaking great swelling words of vanity? God loves you. God's not angry at you. God wants to bless you. It's Joel Osteen-esque. And the religion of Joel Osteen is the secret. That's his religion. Not even a semblance of Christianity. Of even Christianity. Okay? While they promised them liberty... They themselves are the servants of corruption. Because, hey, you, you got to be like the world to win the world, right? Got to be like the world to win the world, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Now think about that. Once you hear the true gospel, the truth of salvation for today, you reject it. You're a child of wrath. You're a child of disobedience. You've heard the truth. You've heard that you're going to go to hell unless the Lord saves you. You've heard it. Okay? And everybody's going to hear the true gospel at some point. Okay? Virtually, I mean, I mean those aborted children, those murdered children, they're in heaven. Okay? A child who dies before they have reached that age of accountability, whatever age that is, they're going to go to be with the Lord. Okay? Because they're not, they're, they're innocent in a sense like that. Okay? But once they know, and once they've heard, you're accountable to the Lord. Okay? Okay? And this is saying, hey, it's, it would be better for you to say that you didn't know rather than knowing and going contrary to what you've heard. And see, that's not the case because the Lord is going to give everybody witness. See? See how that works? Okay? And these Christians, especially the Jesuit trained cemeterians in the pulpits who actually know the truth, but purposely speak contrary to that truth. Ugh. Okay? And you see a lot of these guys here on YouTube and on other ones, on other things like this, okay? But it, but, it, it, but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his male own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her female wallowing in the mire. Go back to Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs... Male. Okay? Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Female. Lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So who are we supposed to witness to, Brad? Uh, are you not listening? What is this talking about? Okay? And isn't it anything judge not that ye be judged, that ye be not judged? Okay? Talking about hypocritical judgment. All right. Someone who doesn't want to hear the truth, like we have just addressed in Second Peter chapter two, okay? They heard the truth of the gospel, but they reject it and want to be entangled, want to be yoked up with that. The latter end is worse with them than the, uh, than the beginning, okay? So there are people that giving them the truth 
you know, casting your pearls before swine and giving that which is holy unto the dogs is kind of futile because they have made their choice. And when you give them the truth, they're just going to turn and rend you. And that happens with someone who has made their choice. They've heard the truth. They want nothing to do with it. And they want to continue on that downward spiral to hell. Okay? All right? But see, there again, what comes into the picture is, well, again, okay, yeah, there are some times, and that's when you need discernment. That's why... All your witnessing ought to be led of the Lord and not of someone trying to make check off a checklist as if they've done their duty for the day. That's why witnessing out there is done of the Lord. Okay? Yes, you could very well say, today I'm going to make sure I'm going to hand out a hundred tracks. And you could do that. But is the Lord guiding you? Go over here. Put them in those cars. No, don't put them in that one. Don't, no, 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 no. Okay, now get out of here. But Lord, it's like, I don't care. You don't go over there. You go where I want you to go. Okay, say, so that's how it works. You let the Lord be the one guide you in your witnessing. Okay, that's how that works. But there are some out there who don't want to hear. They've heard it before, but they don't want to hear it. And you come to them with the truth, they're going to turn and rend you. Why? Because they have made their choice. They're an enemy of the truth. Okay? All right? But see, again, what Christianity will do is say, well, that means that we got to change our tactics and be just like them. We have to be like the world to win the world. And where do they go? Where do they go with that? Where do they go with that? Oh, they go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We've talked about this before. Okay, but uh, brethren, as you have already kind of figured out, this video is not entirely pointed towards you. Okay, First Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 on verse 22. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. That means simply that Paul has been made all things to all men. When We're going to see this, that... The Lord saved him, and he's basically it's like, okay, Lord, wherever you want me to go, that is where I'm going to go. To whomever you want me to witness to, that's who I'm going to witness to. Even if they are of an opposing skin color. I have no respect for someone who clings to, well, I'm of Japheth, but I wouldn't waste time witnessing on to people of Ham because they don't want me around there. <laughs> really? And you really you really believe that, don't you? You're sick. You're sick in your head. Never mind your heart. That filth you call a heart. Okay? You're sick. You're sick. Okay? You're sick if you have that mentality. Okay? You're sick. You're absolutely sick, okay? But, all right, where are we? 19 on verse 21, uh, 22. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I may might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. This doesn't mean that Paul became these things, okay? Okay? This means that he intermingled himself with them in order to preach the gospel. He didn't take on to them what they were. Example, okay? If the Lord says, Brad, there's some sodomites over there, I want you to go witness unto them. That doesn't mean that I'm going to revert back to sodomy, which the Lord saved me from going on 15 years ago in order to witness unto them, Okay? Okay, this doesn't mean that I'm going to become a demokami in order to witness on to demokamis. Okay, I, you, brethren, we are of the church of the living God. The Lord can send you amongst these people as his ambassador. Okay, this is what that is talking about. You do not take on the persona of those you are witnessing to in order to effectually witness on to them. 
Because why? You are doing things carnally. And the kingdom of God is not in word, but in what? Power. See. Okay? To them that are without law, as without law, be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them with them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made. Made. By who? The Lord. All things to all men, that I might by all means save some. The Lord sent Paul all over. And the Lord sent Paul amongst many Gentile people. Paul is the apostle to the Gentile. Okay? So Paul, you know, amongst cannibals, you know, didn't become a cannibal. Um, Paul didn't have the, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. God forbid. No. No. No, as an ambassador of Christ, the Lord will send you in the places, and trust me when I tell you this, the Lord will send you to places that you would never even imagine. Okay? But see, are you going to be open and obedient unto that as Paul? For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. That's what that's talking about. He's like, Lord, I don't care if you're going to send me to Hamites or Shemites. I don't care. Wherever you're going to send me is where you're going to send me. And wherever you're going to send me, I'm going to be obedient unto you and to your word and do as you would have me to do. Okay? That's what Paul is talking about. Contrary to what Christianity tells you in the buildings that, well, in order to reach the world, you got to be like the world. Okay, In order to reach the kids, you got to give the I used to um, um, volunteer at this youth center. I stopped after a while because it was just fruitless. I mean, okay, there were these Christians opening a youth center to be witnesses onto these kids, but yet they gave them all pop and candy, pool tables, video games, and all this nonsense. And yet, and yet, okay, I was there and telling these kids about how uh, they're sinners and they're no good. And it's like, Brad, why would you say that to kids? They need to hear it, man. And of course, I was asked not to come, but I came anyway. But it was, it was a mess. Okay, but their mentality is in order to effectually witness on to them, you have to become like them. No, it's not what the scriptures tell us. Okay, and besides, when you who are supposed to be, you know, not yoked up together with unbelievers, okay, when you who are called out are trying to be as one of them, they'll notice, okay? If you're someone who is actually saved, trying to go down to be like one of those who you are witnessing onto, they're going to notice, okay? They're going to notice. What happens is when the Christian who isn't saved at all, they're just doing what they actually are. They just got a little religiosity, see, okay? All right? We're called to be different, brethren. Okay? We're called to be different. All right? Should we help lost people? Should we? When I was lost, safe people helped me. When you were lost, did not a safe person help you at one time? Especially to the those of the household of faith. Yes, absolutely. But never mind these poor uh, lost people. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. James chapter 4, just one verse. 
verse 4. James chapter 4, verse 4. Just one verse. Just one verse if I can get there. James 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Hmm. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Nothing good usually comes out of it. Now, something good can come out of it. Yes. Yes, that is always a possibility. That is always a possibility. Yes. Yes. But it's way better for you, brother, sister. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Believe me. Believe me. Want an example of this? Want a good example of this? There are actually several, but go to Second Chronicles, chapter 18. Second Chronicles, chapter 18. We're going to look at a really good example of this. And Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Got to remember, this was in a different dispensation. Okay, you have to remember that. But King Jehoshaphat. For, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 18, verses 1 on to verse 3. Now, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. Oh boy. King Ahab. King Ahab. Oh, well, what do we know about King Ahab? Oh, there are plenty of things we know about uh, uh, King Ahab, uh, such as what? Well, you go to 1 Kings, and I just want to, I just want to get this for the reference point of it. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, yes. Uh, Elijah and Ahab, Ahab, whose wife was Jezebel, okay? Yes, King Ahab, who um, had a lot of prophets, who went and itched his ears, who said things that he wanted to hear. Let's, let's continue in 2 Chronicles 18, verses 1 on verse 3. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance and joined affinity with Ahab, evil, wicked Ahab, the husband to Jezebel. Jezebel who manipulated and controlled her husband. Okay? And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Je uh, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people is thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. And of course, you, uh, you can read also about this in 1 Kings chapter 22, okay? All right? But, you go on to read that King Ahab had a whole bunch of his, like, Okay, let's uh, let's hear the prophets. And the prophets were saying to him, Go up and prosper. And then King Jehoshaphat's like, oh, wait, wait a minute, man. Isn't there a prophet of the Lord around here? And then King Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, uh, Yeah, there's one guy, Micaiah. But I hate him. Why? Because he never prophesies good to me, but always evil. What does that mean? Micaiah told King Ahab the truth. And Ahab didn't want to hear it. Ahab would much rather have had... Um, uh, verse 7. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil, the same as Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. And while these all these false prophets... What was it? Over what? Something like 200 or uh, 400 prophets 
of Ahab, all saying, go, prosper, the Lord is behind you. Okay? But yet Micaiah came. <laughs> you go into that, you're going to die. And Israel is going to be without shepherd. And then uh, Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you this guy wouldn't? And then what happens? <coughs> Ahab goes to war and gets killed. Just like Micaiah said. Okay? Now go to 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verses 1 under verse 4. Okay? Now here, now Jehoshaphat is in heaven. Jehoshaphat, who was the son of Asa, or Asha, however you want to pronounce it, Asa, he was a godly king. This, this is why I recommend to you all, brethren, that you read uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, because you can get a whole lot of instruction in righteousness uh, looking at how these kings behaved. Okay, Very good for our instruction in righteousness. But King Jehoshaphat, he was a godly king. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But what was his problem? He yoked himself up with people he should not have. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. We're reading on to verse 4 in uh, 2 Chronicles 19. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Mm. Ahab hated the Lord. Okay? Ahab hated the Lord. He had over 400 prophets that came up to him and told him what he wanted to hear. Okay? Ahab was a little sissy. And I would have told that to his face. He was a little sissy when, uh, what was his name, Naboth or whatever, uh, Naboth wouldn't give him his vineyard and he went and cried to the wall, you know, against the wall and his wife Jezebel, a uh, type of the Roman Catholic Church, is like, why are you crying? Oh, Naboth wouldn't give me his vineyard. It's like, I'll get your vineyard. And she wrote letters in his name and got Naboth killed. Okay, there's Catholicism for you. Jezebel, okay? All right? All right? Ahab hated the Lord. Okay? He hated the Lord. If you're not saved, you are an enemy of the Lord. But see, Ahab made his choice. There are incidences where Ahab did humble himself, yes, but and the Lord had mercy because of that, but his heart was never with the Lord. Ahab is down there waiting for all of you who are going to go down there to be with him. And with your father, Satan. Okay? Ahab hated the Lord. He was an active, participating enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? In our terms. Okay? Of the Lord God our Father, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay? He was an active, open enemy of God. So, because, and Jehoshaphat knew this. And besides, Jehoshaphat, um, Ahab said, I'm going to disguise myself going into the battle, but you wear your kingly garb. So what happened? Because King Jehoshaphat goes in there looking like the king. The people were like, ah, that's Ahab. But and, and Jehoshaphat, when that happened, he's like, ah, he cried out and the Lord, like they figured it out because the Lord protected them. It's like, oh, wait, wait a minute, this, this ain't Ahab. Never mind this guy, we got to find Ahab. And of course, what happened to Ahab? Some guy just threw a bow, shot at a venture, and then just happened to hit Ahab and kill him. Couldn't hide from God's just judgment, see? Yeah, that's Ahab. Yeah, that's Ahab, whom Jehoshaphat made the affinity with. Who Ahab had 400 people who said everything he wanted to hear, Ahab, who would have let someone who said, Jehoshaphat, sometimes not the brightest, uh, bless his heart, and I don't mean that in a southern way. The same Jehoshaphat who said, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. His intentions were good, but Ahab at the same time is like, 
You go ahead and take the fall for me wearing your kingly stuff, and I'm going to disguise myself. There you go. That says a lot about Ahab. He was a little sissy. Okay? So naturally, Ahab hated the Lord. Okay? All right? So hence, and Jehu the son of Hanani, the seer went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. This is an example of what happens when you yoke yourself up with unbelievers. But look at this. Number, uh, verse 3. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Okay? Works. Okay? And his heart to seek God, he wanted to follow after the Lord. Remember, this was written in a different dispensation. This is our instruction in righteousness. And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. So because of Jehoshaphat doing this thing, yoking himself up with uh, Ahab, there was wrath against him. But nevertheless, the Lord saw something good in him, meaning because he was keeping the law. And you got to remember, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, your goodness, like we already saw, uh, came from keeping the law. Okay, keeping the law, different dispensation, no eternal security. The Holy Ghost was not a permanent resident. Okay, you have to remember that. Okay, but now go to 20, chapter 20, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 31 on to verse 37. Okay, I like, <laughs> I like. Jehoshaphat. I really do. I can identify with King Jehoshaphat because um, I've made similar mistakes. I have. I have. I have yoked myself up with people I should not have ever yoked myself up with. And I've paid the penalty and price for that. Now, some of those have turned out to be good. Okay, yes. But the majority of them, the times that I've yoked up with people I shouldn't have, it's always bit me and it's cost me something. Okay? Okay? But, but like I said, I, I, I like Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is in heaven. Absolutely. But Jehoshaphat had this problem. He did. And Jehoshaphat, uh, verses 31 on to the close of the chapter. And then we'll be done. Oh, just about. And Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in the way of Asa his father, and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So see, Jehoshaphat had that testimony. But he yoked himself up with Ahab, and there was wrath against him. But yet he still had this testimony. Okay? It cost Ahab. I mean, it cost Jehoshaphat. We're not even mentioning David, okay, who had Uriah murdered because he slept with Bathsheba, okay? And we're not even going to, we don't even have to mention at the severe cost it cost David for that, even though the Lord used him, okay? All right? It cost David greatly. The sword never departed from his house. Okay, his children had, were committed incest. Okay, his own sons rose up against him. Absalom and uh, what was it, Ammon? Okay, his own the, uh, he wrote, the Lord rose up trouble out of his own house. Okay, the sword never left this house. Okay, it cost David a lot of things. It was a price. That if he could have gone back and done things different, I can guarantee you, and we in heaven, you know, when we're, we're up there with the Lord, we'll be able to one day... <laughs> uh, King David, sir, can I ask you, if, would, what, would you, what would you have done different? Would you have done anything different with Bathsheba? You know what I think David would do to us if we asked him that in heaven while we're up there with the Lord? He'd look at us like... And you're like, yeah, 
And you'd be like, of course I would. I wouldn't have done that with Bathsheba and had Uriah murdered. Well, that's how the, 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 you know, the Lord used it. Are you crazy? Have you read the scriptures? What happened to me because I did that? <laughs> I wouldn't have changed anything. How the Lord got me to himself. I wouldn't have changed a thing. You're crazy. I would have changed everything. Everything. I would have changed every single thing. Oh, there's a whole lot of things I would have changed. No. At first, when you're a babe, it's like, well, that's the path the Lord brought me to himself. But the longer you walk with the Lord, it's like, I would have done everything differently. Everything. And the longer you walk with the Lord, you'll be like that too. Let's continue. Verse 33. Howbeit the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the son, and the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. And after this, did Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. Hold your place. Go to 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. Who is this Ahaziah? <laughs> You're going to like this. Verses 48 on to verse 50. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 48 on to verse 50. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but they went not, for the ships were broken at Ezion Geber. Then said Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, unto Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with thy servants to, in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not. And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father. And Joram his son reigned in his stead. So this, and go back to Second Chronicles. So this, uh, uh, picking up at verse 35 in ver uh, chapter 20. And after this did Jehoshaphat king of Judah join himself with Ahaziah king of Israel, the son of Ahab, who did very wickedly. And he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eliezer, the son of Dodova of Mersha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works. And the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. And that's what can happen to you when you yoke yourself up with unbelievers. Very very and Jehoshaphat right there verse 32 and he walked in the way of Asa his father and departed not from it doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord but yet he had these problems he made affinity with people he should never have done so with <laughs> I have made that mistake myself and I spare you brethren I spare you. I mean, you don't need to know all things. Like I was talking to my best friend last night. You know, there are, you know, and me and my best friend, uh, uh, he's my brother, uh, share virtually everything with him. But there are some things that, you know, it's like I told him. There are some things about me, brother, that you're just going to have to wait until the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> and likewise, you with me. It's like, you know, Brad, I'll talk with you about everything. I'll share with you about uh, virtually anything. But you know what, Brother Brad? There are certain things about me you're just going to have to wait till the judgment seat of Christ to find out. <laughs> Meaning because when we're all at the ju judgment seat of Christ, we're all going to find out all our little secrets, all our little things that we haven't done or have done. We're all going to know about it one another. That's going to be it for this video, brethren. Um, 
like I said, um, thank you to my dear brother who basically was the catalyst for this video um, about, you know, should we not help the lost at all? Well, when reading what we just read about with Jehoshaphat, but then again, you know, that's up between you and the Lord. That's where discernment, and that's why the Lord is the one who ought to be the one who's guiding you in your witness. Okay? But to, to, um, to like it says in Isaiah chapter 65, uh, verse 5, you know, there are a lot of people out there, and it seems within the King James Bible believing movement that have this Isaiah 65 mentality when it comes on to lost people. Isaiah 65, verse 5, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Okay? These are a smoke of my nose and a fire that burneth all the day. I can barely see that. But, you know, there is that mentality being taught amongst King James Bible-believing Christians. That's where discernment comes in. That's where, you are you doing what the Lord would have you to do? Remember from where you came. Remember who of the church of the living God was there for you at one time. When no one else would be. How do you answer that? How do you answer that? It's going to be it for this video, brethren. Thank you so much for watching if you do. <laughs> Going to get this video uploaded. Um, like I said, uh, the last couple of days have been very busy. Had a lot of things going on. Um, praise the Lord. Uh, pay the bills. And we received a gift um, that we were able to go and get provision. So praise the Lord for that. But um, thank you, brethren. Thank you, brethren. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. I love you. We'll see you in the next video.